All right. Well, last week we looked at the topic, be authentic. Be authentic because this needs to be turned on. Because life's too short and the stakes are too high to keep being fake. We talked about the plasticness, the fakeness sometimes of, of uh, religion versus authentic Christian faith. Friend, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that we must be authentic with each other and authentic with the world for them to see Christ and not us. You see, the only way that I can point somebody to Christ is for my life to do what John the Baptist said and take a step back so that they might see Jesus. The world doesn't need to see better Christians world needs to see him. Amen? And so that's what we believe, that we need to be authentic because life's too short. And we looked at that and, and we saw what it meant to, to really live a life of authenticity. Well, this morning we're going to be looking at something different, but I want to revisit. Remember Barb, her husband Ken, and Joe sitting in the back of the church? Remember we talked about them, how they had all these issues going in their life. And, and, and Barb really dolled up really nice. And, and nobody would ever know that she had issues going on. But boy, she was struggling with alcoholism and all that stuff. And Barbie and her well, husband, Ken, just were that perfect look. And we saw the pun and the joke and you know, all that. It's Barb, Ken, and Barbie. And all those people that are in church. And then Joe back there, macho man, every, seemed like everything together and all things are great. Certainly would never want to let on that he was wounded and hurt and all those things that had happened in his life. He couldn't get it together, but boy, he sure looked the part because he was G.I. Joe. Right? Well, let me tell you about Barb and Joe. Somebody broke through the veneer. They saw help and they... They received help from a, a God who's always there and always willing. They began to get their lives together. And when they got their lives together, man, something happened to them. They changed. You know, they were not afraid to be real anymore. The plastic, disingenuous shell began to break down. And the real Joe and the real Barb began to show. And you know what? They fell more and more in love with Jesus Christ. It began to impact everything they did. Now I'm making this up as we go along. Do you realize that? <laughs> it began to impact everything they did. And they got more and more excited about the things that, that God was doing in their lives. And, and so pretty soon they were radically on fire for the kingdom, for Christ. Man, they had stuff going. They were 100% sold out to the things of God. Well, they're in that same church that they were afraid to be real in, remember? Everybody celebrated when they finally got themselves together. Well, it didn't take long for people to start going, well, guys, you know, you might want to calm down just a little bit. I mean, if that, matter of fact, they were told this thing that I've heard Remember, life is a marathon, not a sprint. You don't want to be one of those fanaticals. <laughs> don't become one of those Bible thumpers. They got introduced to the Cold Water Committee. Their fire began to get quenched. So Barb and Joe continued on their spiritual roller coaster. Because they were told they needed to be authentic. The Spirit of God convicted them they needed to be authentic. But when they were, it didn't take long for people to say, well, you need to kind of hide that again. And just blend in. Don't rock the boat. Don't make any waves. Why? Well, we'll see why. Because this morning we're going to see that not only should we be authentic, but I believe beyond a shadow of doubt God wants us to be devoted. 
not just authentic, but devoted. You see, I can be real all day long, but if I remain the way I am, and I'm not growing in grace and wisdom and knowledge of the Lord, and I'm not growing spiritually, I'm not progressing in this Christian life, then I'm just being authentically plain and authentically useless. You see, because not only do we need to get real with ourselves and real with others, we need to recognize the reality of who we are and the reality of who He is. And you and I have a responsibility to fall in love with Jesus more and more and more every single day. And that is displayed in our devotion to Him. If I were to ask you a question, are you devoted? How would you answer that question? Don't do it now. But think about it. How would you answer that question? Am I devoted? What am I devoted to? What are the things in my life or the people in my life to whom I'm devoted? You can start ticking them off and naming them off. And you can think about them in your heart and in your mind. But, but I want to ask you, where does the Lord fall in that scheme of things? In that hierarchy of your devotion, where is He? You see, because what we learn over the years of living in this life called the Christian faith is that our only first priority needs to be our devotion to Him. Because when we put Him first, everything else can fall in line and in place. When we get that reversed order, when we get that out of order, what we think we're being devoted to, we can't fully be devoted to because something's amiss, something's wrong. You see, we are to put Him first in everything so that then we have the clarity of thought and mind and heart to truly be devoted to other things. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things, Scripture said, will be added unto you. So everything falls in place when He is first. So this morning we're going to look at this thing called being devoted because life's too short to miss any time getting to know and love the Lord more. Life's too short to miss the opportunity to fall in love with Jesus more today than you were yesterday. Are you with me? Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Mark. The Gospel of Mark. And look at chapter number 14. We're going to look at a very, very, very familiar passage. It's one that you're going to say, oh, we've seen this before. But that's okay because we can see it from a little different lens today. Amen? We're going to look at it from this perspective of being devoted being devoted. As we look at this, verse, the first 11 verses, let's read a couple to start with. Now, the Passover and, un of, and unleavened bread was two days off. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him. For they were saying, not during the festival, lest there be a riot of the people. So here we have a group of people scheming on how they could arrest Jesus try him and kill him. So we're two days away from that fateful passion weekend, right? We're two days away and here they are trying their best to figure out how in the world we can stop this man called Jesus. He is making waves. He, he is, I'm telling you, he is shaking things up. He, he's fighting against the establishment. He, he's, he's threatening our way of life. As a matter of fact, he came into town and he rode on a little donkey and everybody was shouting, Hosanna! we got to do something about that. That's not making us very comfortable. So the first thing I want us to notice is this. True devotion will be threatening to some. Barb and Joe found out that when they started being real with how they felt about the Lord, and they were willing to not only be transparent about their sins, but transparent about their love for Christ and their devotion to Him, there were some people that kind of got uncomfortable with that. And they began to do things against them. It was threatening to them. The scribes, chief priests, the religious leaders, they wanted to put a stop to it. Friend, listen. 
I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that there are people in churches all over this land and all over the world that like to think of themselves as super spiritual. But in reality, what they are is they're super comfortable with being who they are and being the one that kind of sets the tone for everything else. And anything that tries to shake that up or anything that tries to make that a little different becomes uncomfortable and threatening to them. And people will do whatever they can to stop it. Yes? It happens all the time. But you see, I believe that in spite of that, there's one thing that can overcome it. And what is that that can overcome it? Obviously, it's the Lord, because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, right? And, and, and we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, right? And so listen, if the majority of the people would be willing to be uncomfortable and sell out and be devoted and give everything they can to him and to all that, that they know of him, and to learn to love him and love others more and more and more, to love like you've never been hurt, to become more and more devoted, then guess what? Those that aren't comfortable with that begin to become the minority. Things change. You see, I believe for us to be who God has called us to be, I believe for us to be what God wants us to be, both individually and corporately, we need to learn that even though it's threatening to some, it's okay to be sold out. It's okay to be devoted to the one who deserves our devotion. Are you with me? Think about what God has done for you. Think about what he has done in your life. Think about the reality of salvation in that we were yet sinners and Christ died for us. We deserved a sinner's hell forever and ever, but Jesus stood in the gap, took our place, died a cruel and horrific death, defeated death in raising from the dead, and now wishes that we would have everlasting life in him think about what he has done friend I don't know about you that's devotion I talked with somebody the other day that was really hurt and really feeling down you know why because they had served in a, in a ministry for a long long time they had served in that ministry for for over 20 years And then an opportunity for advancement came up within the ministry. And so they were excited about that. They thought, surely my devotion to this thing is going to be great. And I'll do that. And then they were passed over by someone who'd been there just a short time. I don't know all the details. I can't pretend to know all the details. But I just know how this individual felt. That their devotion... Their commitment meant absolutely nothing. Friend, listen. To whom or to what are we devoted? Is there anything in our lives that deserve more devotion than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Is there anything? Listen, we just be encourage you to understand and to remember and to know that the more you seek to be devoted to him, it will be threatening to some. But that's okay. Because God's got this. Amen? Not only will we see our true devotion be threatening to some, Oh, I'm sorry, there's the verse that we read. It was now two days before the Passover and the feast, feast of unleavened bread, and the chief priests and scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. So they were scheming all along, right? But not only will true, devo true devotion be threatening to some, but true devotion will reveal Jesus for who he really is. <laughs> this is so good. 
It will reveal Jesus for who he really is. There's a woman in our story. Look at verse number three. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of one with a pure non, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. Now we know the story, and a lot of times people get confused with this and another time Jesus was anointed. There was a woman who anointed Jesus and, and poured it on his head and then washed her, his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair and all that stuff. This is a different case. That was at an earlier time in a different place. Now he's in Bethany, outside in the outskirts of Jerusalem. And here he is at the house of Simon the leper. And when we see this, tradition says at that house of Simon the leper, many people believe that Simon, who was the leper, was actually the father of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what a lot of tradition says. And so that he was actually at their home. And the woman who was pouring out this flask, although not named, many believe was Mary Magdalene. We don't know for sure. Mary, the, the sister of Martha, we don't know for sure. But it, it, it fits and it works and that's okay, right? The bottom line is we look and see what she has done. You see, true devotion will reveal Jesus for who he really is. Jesus is at this home, this place, Bethany, the place of rest. And he's there at Simon's home. He's reclining at the table. Think about that. Jesus is reclining at the table. He is resting in the place of rest. He knows where he's headed. He knows what he's about to do. He knows what's coming up. And he's resting because it's going to be the greatest thing hardship he's faced in his entire human existence <laughs> and here he's approaching that and he's resting he's reclining at the table and this woman comes in with an alabaster flask an alabaster flask alabaster was a was an almost translucent precious stone it was very expensive itself it would have been ornate it would have been beautiful and inside was an ointment or pure nard not it's sometimes called spike nard, not lard, okay? Mm -hmm. right. Spike nard or nard. A very expensive perfume that had to be imported. Experts say that, that probably the value of that ointment in that flask would have been about equal to an entire year's wages for the average worker. Expensive. And notice what she does. I love this. It doesn't say she opened the flask and poured it over his head. What did she say? She broke the flask <coughs> and poured it over his head. Now, why that is, I don't fully know. I've heard lots of different theories. But the one thing it says to me is that flask could never be used again. She took what she had, the most precious thing that she had, the most valuable item that she probably had in her possession. And she broke it and poured it on the head of Christ. She broke it, never to be used again, and poured it on the head of her master. Such was her devotion to him. I've got a question. What does our devotion look like? What are we willing to break to expend on him? What are we willing to give up? What are we willing to pass on? What are we willing to surrender in order to be devoted to the master? What am I willing to say, Lord, I don't need any more. Lord, I am giving it all up for you. You see, devotion is, it is an important thing. Why? Think about it. Is anybody in your life devoted to you? Just think. Is there anybody in your life that's devoted to you? How does it feel when they express that? How does it feel? How does it feel when sometime they 
act like they really aren't devoted anymore. <laughs> Does it hurt? Friend, listen. There's no one who's ever existed that deserves more of our devotion than the one who made us and the one who gave himself to redeem us. This woman got it. She understood. She took it upon herself to, to act out her devotion in a very public <laughs> and very succinct way. And in doing so, she gave up that which she had and she broke it so that it could not be used for anything else. In other words, she left it all. Friend, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt there's some of us here today, and I say us, some of us here today, that need to learn that kind of devotion. And we need to take that which we have and we need to lay it at the feet of the Master. Recognize and realize that our devotion to Him is critical to who we are and to what we are and to our influence in the world. See, we need to be authentic, but in our authenticity, we need to be devoted 100% to him. But now notice something else. I said that true devotion will reveal Jesus for who he really is. Not only will it reveal the woman's incredible devotion to him, but it reveals Jesus for who he really is. Now why in the world? Poured it over his head. Why? Why? Go with me to verse number 6. I didn't put this in here. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed for me. For the poor you will have with you, and where, whenever you wish, and you do them good. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body for burial beforehand. And listen, this woman got it. She knew. She understood what, what many of the disciples couldn't quite get. Jesus was here for a reason, and his reason did not include overthrowing the Roman government. His reason for being here was overthrowing death, hell, and the grave. She saw what he had prophesied that he would do, and she recognized what it meant. And she took this incredible, expensive ointment that was used in the process of preparing bodies for burial, and she Pouring it on the Master, recognizing and seeing that he came to save. He was the Lamb who would be slain. He was the prophesied Messiah who would sacrifice himself for the sins of men. She saw it. She laid it out. You see, it was revealed in her devotion who Jesus really is. Friend, listen, when you and I will live a life of devotion, it will reveal to others just how important and special Jesus is. Amen? Well, I'm glad you guys listened fast. True devotion will be threatening to some. True devotion will reveal Jesus for who he really is. And third, true devotion will be criticized by others. Look at the bystanders. Look at those folks hanging out. Look at verse number four. But some said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. Here's this woman, devoted and loving, took that which she had and she broke it and she poured it on the mattress. She ministered to him. She recognized he was headed for burial. He was headed for death. And she said, I love you for it. And she poured it out on him in full devotion to him. And some looked at that and said, why are you wasting that money? <coughs> Friend, listen. Some people are always going to criticize your devotion. Some people are going to say, why are you wasting your time with that silly little church that ain't going to amount to anything? Some people may say, why are you so devoted 
when all you have to do is just go to church once once a week and say a few little prayers and everything's good and then you live your life the way you want to live it. Why are you devoting all that extra time and energy? Why do you depend on that crutch called Christianity? Have you ever heard that? Why be devoted to a concept that's thousands of years old? To which we would answer very clearly and, and sincerely, I'm not devi- devoted to a concept. I'm devoted to a person whose name is Jesus. Amen? You see, people couldn't see through what she did to find the reason why she had done it. You see, their devotion was not the level hers was. And all they saw was the potential to do something good. And they failed to see that what she had done was actually the best. But let me tell you, sometimes the greatest enemy of God's best in your life is the good. Not the bad. You see, sometimes we're tempted to be devoted just enough to look a little more spiritual than the next guy. Amen? Everybody's getting quiet. Sometimes we're tempted to just have our devotion just matter a little bit or just be enough to, to feel okay. To somehow salve our conscience, if you will. To not feel like maybe, to feel like maybe the Lord looks at us and says, okay, they're doing all right. You know the commercials that are out right now about the doctor says, well, he's just okay. You know? Well, he's just okay. Your brain surgery, well, he's just okay. Right? I don't think so. Friend, listen, I don't want my devotion to be just okay. Of course, do you want your Christian experience, your Christian life, your Christian Christian testimony, your witness? You want it to just be okay? Or do you want it to be seen as fully devoted to the King who loves you and gave himself for you? Well, if you do, guess what? People will criticize you. But that's okay. Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. Blessed are they. So let them wail, let them moan, let them jeer, let them point, let them laugh. It's okay. Because what matters most is that we do what this woman did. And gave her all. We need to do the same. So not only do we need to be authentic and be real, we need to be devoted devoted to him. And listen, that shows up in the subtle ways that some people will never ever see. That shows up in the in, in the evidentiary ways of you know our presence and, and what we do and how we say and how we talk and how we live and all that stuff. But there are ways that are inside that nobody else will ever see where our devotion really shows up. Question. True devotion will be threatening to some. True devotion will reveal Jesus for who he really is. True devotion will be criticized by others. And at number four, true devotion will expose the truth in others. True devotion will expose the truth in others. Look at Judas. Oh, everybody say Judas. Judas. Look at verse number 10, if you will. Here's what it says. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. There is no question in my heart and mind that the one who was leading the criticism about this money could have been used to give to the poor and all that stuff was this man himself. I believe beyond a shadow of doubt he would have been front and center. Matter of fact, he was the one that held the money bag, right? He would have been the one that was most 
aware of those things and would have said, why are you wasting that money on pouring that on his head? He would have been the same one that probably was criticizing when the little children were coming up, pushing in front of the adults and wanting to get to Jesus. And Jesus said, suffer not the little children to come unto me. Don't criticize them. Don't stop them for such is the kingdom of heaven. Then he put them on his lap and he began to talk to the kids. Be the same person that would look at that and say, why are we doing that? We shouldn't waste that resource on those children. One day they need to grow up. Friend, I don't know about you, but I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that sometimes what the world sees is a waste. What God's economy sees is absolutely right. You can't out-love Jesus. Your love is never wasted. Your devotion is never wasted. Your gift in His name for His glory is never wasted. Are you with me? You cannot give too many cups of cold water in the name of Jesus. You cannot serve others too much. You cannot help give. The one who loves you. Though you can believe without question that when you do, some will rise up. And I believe more than pointing a finger at who you are, it exposes everyone to who they are at heart. Are you with me? Judas was revealed. He began to plot. Probably because he wasn't getting his way. We know it's a lot deeper than that, but we don't need to get with all that theology right now. For today's purpose, he just was exposed. Amen? True devotion will be threatened to some. True devotion will reveal Jesus for who he really is. True devotion will be criticized by others. You can count on it. True devotion will expose the truth to others. And fifth and finally, somebody say, Amen. Amen. True devotion will be defended. By Jesus himself. Oh, I love this. I love this. Remember up there I said the woman? Now I want you to see I refer to her again, but I changed it just a little bit. And I refer to her as the wise, devoted. Wise, why? Because she recognized where Jesus was headed. Wise, why? Because she knew that at that point in time, the Son of God, who was also the Son of Man, in his humanity, desperately <laughs> needed to be ministered to. And so she did. Wise in that she recognized and realized that that which she had that was valuable to her could not ever be used for a greater thing than right then, right there, to minister to his needs. Wise. Fully devoted. This woman gave it all. And then she was criticized resoundingly. But hallelujah, what do we see beyond a shadow of a doubt? Jesus himself defended her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. He said, you will not always have me. He's talking about himself in human form, incarnate Christ, right there, tangible for them to touch and see and hear. You will not always have me, he said. She has done what she could. In other words, that, that word could there, she's done what she could, what was possible for her. Not just part of what she could. She had done all that was possible for her. Do you get it? She had done everything she could in the moment. She had expressed her devotion fully to the full extent of who she was and her ability to express it. Are you with me? She had given 100%. And the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he said, that's a good thing. 
And he praised her for it. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body before I had prepared it. Then verse 9. Are you with me? And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her friend. Talk about being an influencer. You know? That, that was the equivalent of a gazillion likes on Facebook. Right? That, that was like having more Twitter followers than anybody in all of history. <laughs> right? Jesus said, wherever this gospel is proclaimed, and how many times has the gospel been proclaimed? How often has the word of God been preached? Where is it, where is it reached? All around the world. And every time, what in the world happens? This woman is praised and remembered for her devotion to Jesus. Friend, listen, in the grand scheme of things, there is nothing greater we can do than to be fully devoted to the Master. You see, because it's in our devotion that He'll lead us to what He wants us to do. It's in our devotion that He'll use us to reach others for Himself. It's in our devotion that He will cause us to choose against what's comfortable for us and use us to expand His kingdom. It's in our devotion that He'll use us to minister to the hurting and the broken and the weary around us. It's in and through our devotion that He will use us to accomplish His purpose in our lives. This woman's a hero. She's a hero because Jesus said it. It would not just be remembered for what I did. He said it would be remembered, told in memory of her. song theologically combined all the different ones, but <laughs> it's okay. The point is clear. What does our devotion look like? What is our devotion? This morning I believe this morning I believe we've been called we've been called to devotion. We need to be authentic real. You see, part of being authentic and real is recognizing that we've got a long way to go. Anybody admit with me that I am still a work in, that you're still a work in process? God ain't finished yet. Hallelujah. Amen. How is he going to improve? How is he going to work on us? He's going to work on us as we become more and more devoted to surrender to him. <laughs> now that's people say. Thank you for joining us at Grace Point Church. To find out more information about Grace Point Church, go to our website at www.gracepointsc.org. You can also connect with us on social media through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. To listen to sermon audio and other content from Grace Point Church, subscribe to the Grace Point Church podcast on all major platforms. As well as subscribe to our YouTube page to watch sermon videos and other video content there as well. If you'd like to tune in on a Sunday morning and watch our, our services live, you can do that on our Facebook page, on YouTube page, and also through uh, Twitter and Periscope. 
for Pastor Ben Hill and Grace Point Church. I'm James Hicks. Thank you for tuning in.